I hope that you'll turn with me in a Bible to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51. As we look together at verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 51, verses 1 to 3. And we've been looking at the servant songs in Isaiah. This promise that the Lord makes to his people that he will raise up, he will send a servant who will be faithful where his people have been faithless. And he's told his people over and over again to trust in that servant, to look to that servant to provide what they need. And we're in between servant songs here when we come to chapter 51, but what we have in chapter 51 is further encouragement to trust in God's promises of the coming servant. Further encouragement to trust in God's promises. And remember that the prophet is writing to weary, discouraged, and hopeless people. He's writing to people who have seen their nation conquered, overthrown, seen their city raised to the ground, seen their temple destroyed, seen all the things that they were counting on be destroyed. And many of them were carried off into exile to the city of Babylon, modern-day Iraq. And for 70 years, they didn't know if they would ever make it back back home. And not only did they wonder if they would ever make it back home, they wondered if it was worth going back home. The city of Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. What is there for us? It's a desert. It's a wasteland. Why go back? Discouraged, weary people. And yet the Lord makes promise after promise, provides encouragement upon encouragement that not only will they go home, but the ruins will be rebuilt. And not only that, he makes promises that reach beyond their time and place. He makes promises to the church. He makes promises to his people, the people of Jesus saved by the grace of God. So that the city that God's people are looking forward to is not ultimately Jerusalem, it's the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem, heavenly Zion. That's the ultimate promise. But in the meantime, he does fulfill these promises for these people who are in exile. He does bring them back. They do rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. These glorious promises about the future. But when they look at where they are in Babylon, and they look at how far they have to go to get back home, and they look at how destroyed everything is, they need ongoing encouragement because their circumstances just don't seem to bear this out. Why should they believe this? And God is a God who knows our frame. He knows that we need repetition. He knows that we need even redundancy, to have our faith in him stoked, to have our confidence in his promises renewed, to have the joy of salvation restored to us. We need encouragement upon encouragement, and that's what the Lord gives here. So let's read these verses and look at these glorious promises that the Lord makes regarding their future. Listen to me. You who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, 
her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Let's start by noticing who he makes these promises to. Listen, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. And if you back up to chapter 50, verse 10, we see that these are the same people who are asked, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word, the voice of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. In other words, those who believe that the Lord will send a Savior, will send a servant who has a well-instructed tongue, who knows the word that can sustain the weary. Those of you who are obeying the voice of his servant. These are the same people as those who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Each descriptor provides a different angle on this one task of faith and obedience. And notice that these people are people who will walk in the dark, who have no light, who don't know exactly where the Lord is taking them or leading them. And we see the warning in verse 11 about trying to kindle our own fire, to try to rely on our own flames. He says that will just lead to torment because those lights will not last forever. Trust in the Lord even when he leads you through the dark. Even when he leads you through the dark. He is still faithful. You can still trust him. Listen for his voice. Listen for his voice. So these are the people who are pursuing righteousness. Those people who are chasing those things that are good and right and pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. And notice that it's not just a matter of morality. It's not just a matter of trying to pursue what's good. It's a matter ultimately of seeking the Lord. You can't pursue righteousness without seeking the Lord who is righteous. And we have the promise of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be filled with the very presence of God. So that's who is being addressed here. Who among you who are discouraged, who are downcast, who feel like you're stuck in Babylon, who think you have no future, those who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord, listen up. Listen up. I'm not done with you. I have more to say. And what does he promise? He promises for those who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord, that their circumstances will be completely transformed. Completely transformed. The Lord will surely comfort Zion, that is his people. He will look with compassion on all her ruins, uh, the city of Jerusalem being an image of God's people. He will make her deserts like Eden, a new creation. Eden, the garden of the Lord, this place that God designed for Adam and Eve, this place that gives life, this place that was designed for them to enjoy, to walk with the Lord in the cool of the evening, to enjoy the abundance of his good provision, his good blessings for his people. You see a desert now, but the Lord can transform that desert into Eden, the garden of the Lord. Her wastelands will be like the garden of the Lord. What a promise, what a blessing. These people who for 70 years have been wondering if they have a future, they're told joy and gladness will be found in her. Joy and gladness. The sound of thanksgiving, the sound of singing, music. What a glorious promise. 
But we have to ask the question, how can these people who currently are stuck in Babylon, who are currently discouraged, how can they get to this point of joy and gladness and thanksgiving and the sound of music? How does this happen? Well, this is where we need to bear down on verse 2, the intervening verse here. And what the Lord says they are to do is to look backward. To look backward. About 1,500 years. To Abraham. To Sarah. Look to the rock from which you were cut. Look to where you came from. And here's why this matters. That seems like a long time ago. Why would God want his people to look that far back? Doesn't he want them to face the future and to move forward with faith and boldness? Well, yes, but as we read in our rearview mirrors, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. The reality of what God did in and through and with Abraham and Sarah is closer than they appear. And for his people to move from where they are now to where he's promised, they've got to look back. And we all have to remember that we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. And that means that walking by faith calls for walking backward. Walking backward. We are to back our way into the future. We back our way into the future. When we look to the future, maybe we can't see it. We know what God's promised, but right now we're in the dark. We feel like we're in a wilderness. Look back. Look back to the rock from which you were cut. The quarry from which you were dug. Look back. Back into the future. That's how we walk by faith. And when we do that, when we cast our glance back to this rock, from this, to this quarry, we look back to Abraham, our father, to Sarah, who bore us. What do we see? What does the Lord want us to see here? The Lord wants us to see their smallness. He wants us to see their smallness. He says, when I called Abraham, he was only one man. Smallness. And where was Abraham when God first called him? Right where these people are now. It was known as the land of Ur then, but at this time, it's the land of the Babylonians. So God has done mighty works here before. He's called his people from this very same place. When it was just a, a couple, a man and a woman. And where did he tell them to go? Did he give them a, a place on the GPS? No, he said, to the land I'll show you. To the land I'll show you. Leave your father, leave your home, leave the things you know, and go to the place I will show you. Trust me. And what it shows us is that God isn't looking for a plentiful people. God is looking for a faithful people. God isn't looking for a plentiful people. He's looking for a faithful people. Are we faithful in going when he says go? Never mind if anyone goes with us. Never mind if there's a crowd he said, go. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Is that you? Is that me? See the smallness and see what God does with that. See how he multiplies them. See how he tells Abraham, look to the stars in the sky. So also will be your descendants. I'll multiply them. Yes, you're one now but what you are now is not what you ultimately will be. 
We have this principle taught throughout the scriptures. What, what does Jesus say about the mustard seed? The mustard seed. Teeny little seed. Matthew 17, verse 20. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith, faith, that's what it's about. Not numbers, not resources, not power, not position, but faith. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Faith as small as a mustard seed. Just barely there. But oh, what power! Oh, what God does through faithful people who just do what He says to do. Who just look for those opportunities to share His good news. Maybe they're alone. Maybe you feel ill-equipped, but God has opened a door of opportunity for you to pray with this person because they've opened up to you, they've shared with you, so you do it. it. Yes, it's just you. No, you don't have the whole church with you. Maybe you don't even have your Bible with you, but the Lord has opened an opportunity, so you obey. Those are the kind of people the Lord is looking for. Consider the story of, of Gideon. Gideon, Judges 7. God's people, Israel, are facing the mighty Midianites. They're oppressed. They're, they're living under the thumb of the Midianites. But God raises up Gideon. And initially, Gideon has 32,000 warriors at his side. I'll take those odds. But what does the Lord tell Gideon? In Judges 7, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now, announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So, 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. His numbers are reduced from 32,000 down to 10,000. Why? Because the Lord says, if you're victorious with these numbers, you're going to think that you did it. But you didn't. You have too many. We've got to thin out the ranks. God will have the glory at the end of the day. God will have the glory. Okay, well, 10,000, that's, that's pretty good. I'd stand with 10,000. The Lord says, you still have too many. Take them down to the water. See how they lap up the water. And Using this test of, of who laps up the water, who bends down, he narrows it down to 300. From 10,000 to 300. We've gone from 32,000 to 22,000 now, to, to 10,000 now to 300. To 300. The Lord isn't looking for plentiful people. He's looking for faithful people. And it's Mother's Day, so let this be an encouragement to moms. Let this be an encouragement. That those seemingly simple, mundane things you do for your children are not in vain. The Lord uses that. Every diaper change, every lunch you pack, Every time you're transporting your kids to, to dance or soccer or whatever activities they're involved in. And when, when they get older, those encouraging texts, those long conversations, maybe late into the night, it's not in vain. Yes, it seems small. Yes, it may be overlooked. You may think, is it worth it? I want to do something bigger, greater. The Lord uses those things. Look to the rock from which you were cut, to the quarry from which you were dug. Look at what God did with Abraham and Sarah. Trust Him to use your faithfulness for His glory. Trust Him. And when you don't see it now, look back and back your way into the future. The Lord also wants to show 
the barrenness of Abraham and Sarah. The barrenness of Abraham and Sarah. Remember how old Abraham was when the Lord told him you were going to have a son, a child of promise? Ninety-nine. Ninety-nine. As good as dead, the scripture says. As good as dead. And what was his initial reaction? Ha! He laughed. And when Sarah initially heard that she and her age and her barrenness was going to have a son, what was her initial reaction? Ha! You gotta be kidding me. What a joke. The Lord's messing with me. (laughs) And when we look back on Abraham and Sarah and their example, we're not so much looking back on what they did, but on what the Lord did in them and through them. Because when we look back on the rock from which we're cut, speaking of our our own biological families, praise God if you were raised in a home where the name of Jesus was revered, where the training and instruction of the Lord was taught faithfully, Praise God if you had a mom and a dad who loved Jesus. That is an immeasurable blessing. May the Lord provide more homes like that. But if you look back on your home and that's not what you see, if you look back on your family and that's not what you see, be encouraged that there are no perfect families in the Bible. Not even with Abraham and Sarah. Remember the whole thing with Hagar? How Sarah and Abraham thought, we can't wait on the Lord's promise. We can make this happen on our own. Right? They didn't trust him. They laughed initially in the face of their barrenness. Trust that God isn't looking for confident people. He's looking for people who are confident in him. He's looking for people who look at their own state, who look at their own resources, and know they're barren. They can't do it. It doesn't matter how faithful we are in family devotions. It doesn't matter how many times we tell our children about Jesus. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. The Lord must do it. Yes, he uses faithful means. Let's be faithful. Let's trust him. Let's be confident in the means he's provided. We don't trust in ourselves. We trust in him. We're barren on our own. Yes. Trust him. And let's be faithful to use the resources that he's provided. Use the means that he's provided. Let's use his word. Let's claim his promises. Let's turn to him in prayer. Let's be faithful. Let's be confident in what he does because this is how the Lord works. Think about Gideon again. Okay, God narrows down their numbers to 300. Now, does he just send them into the Midianite camp to slay them? No. What does he do? He sends them at night with torches and trumpets. And when they break the torches and they shout, For Gideon, for the Lord! then it's the Lord who wins the battle. The Midianites wake up and turn on one another. It's the craziest battle strategy you've ever heard of. Why? Because the Lord will have the glory. He's the one who's victorious. The battle is the Lord's. So trust in the Lord. Trust in how he works. Trust that he can do it, even in our barrenness. When you don't see it now, and you don't see how he could do it with where things stand right now, back into the future. Look back to Abraham, to Sarah. Look back to Gideon. Look at how he's worked in in the lives of biblical characters. Look back in your own life. Look at how God has been faithful to you. Look at how he's made a way where there was no way. Look at how his providence has worked so much out for you. Look at how you're here now. (laughs) You're here now. 
and you have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Don't overlook that. If that's all you have, that's, that's all the light you can see in the darkness, don't take it for granted. Don't overlook it. Because the Lord also wants us to see their hopelessness. Their hopelessness. God isn't looking for powerful people. God isn't looking for powerful people. He's looking for people who trust in His power. He's looking for people who trust in His power. And this is exactly what is commended in Abraham and in Sarah. Consider these words from Romans 4, begin at verse 18. Against all hope, hoping against hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Hoping against hope. Hoping against hope. There's no logical, reasonable basis for hope here. Abraham is barren. Sarah is barren. And yet the Lord promised. And if the Lord promises, He'll do it. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? No! He's just as powerful now as he was then. He's just as faithful now as he was then. Trust that he is able. He'll do it. Even when you have to hope against all hope. Trust him. Trust in his power. His unique, unrivaled power to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Trust that his grace is sufficient. Look to the rock from which you were cut. Look back. Back your way into the future. And consider those who have gone before. Many are familiar with the name of Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher in London. He preached to millions of people in the course of his lifetime, and many more millions through his published sermons after his death. And just to illustrate his fame when he died, 100,000 people lined the streets of London to watch his casket go by. 100,000 people. The name of Charles Spurgeon is very well known. Far less known is the name of his mother, Eliza Spurgeon. Eliza Spurgeon. And Charles Spurgeon gave all the credit to his mother for where he ended up. He saw how the Lord used her. He continually looked back on the rock from which he was cut. For example, his father was a minister of the gospel and often needed to travel for his work. And so, on Sunday evenings, on the Lord's Day, Eliza Spurgeon gathered with her children with an open Bible and read it and explained it to them and prayed for them with tears in her eyes. This is what Charles Spurgeon says about it. And the question was asked, how long would it be before we would think about our state? 
How long before we would seek the Lord? Then came a mother's prayer. And some of the words of that prayer we shall never forget, even when our hair is gray. How long have you had that conversation with your kids, with your grandkids? How long before you consider your state? How long before you seek the Lord? How long before you pursue righteousness? Have you had that prayer with them? This is the power of prayer, the effectual prayer that stood behind Charles Spurgeon's ministry. This is the rock from which he was cut. Here's another thing she was known to say. Now, Lord, if my children go on in their sins, it will not be from ignorance that they perish. And my soul must bear a swift witness against them at the day of judgment if they lay not hold of Christ. Do you know what she's saying? She's saying at the judgment seat of Christ, I would have to raise my hand and say, Lord, they're not ignorant. I told them about the gospel. And, and, and Charles says that this idea of his, his mother, his own beloved mother bearing witness against him had a, a stirring, searing effect upon his soul that his own mother loved Jesus that much. And at other times, she was known to simply wrap her arms around his neck the neck of Charles, who was known as an unruly, disobedient child, she would throw her arms around his neck and cry out, Oh, that my son might live before thee! Oh, that my son might live before thee! Notice what she wants above all is for her son to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Her, her preeminent concern isn't, Lord, would you spare him the horror of hell? Lord, Lord, would you take him to heaven so I can see him again? No, the preeminent concern is, Lord, would he know you? Lord, would he walk with you? Would he glorify you and enjoy you forever? That's the heart of her prayer. Well, in God's good time, Charles did grow up to be converted. And after his conversion he wrote a birthday letter to his mom. And here's what he said. You, my mother, have been the great means in God's hand of rendering me what I hope I am. Your kind, warning, Sabbath evening addresses were too deeply settled on my heart to be forgotten. Your kind, warning addresses. I have any courage if I feel prepared to follow my Savior, not only into the water, but should he call me even into the fire. I love you as the preacher to my heart of such courage, as my praying, watching mother. As my praying, watching mother. Would the Lord raise up more praying, watching mothers in our midst? Would we pray for our children with this kind of zeal and fervor? Would we trust the Lord in His power? Would we have our confidence in Him and what He can do? Would we be faithful even when we don't see the results or the numbers, would we be faithful? Would we back our way into the future, trusting Him, looking to the rock from which we were cut, looking to the quarry from which we were dug, looking to Abraham, looking to Sarah, looking to those who have gone before? Would we be spurred on to love and good works because of what we see there? Moms, would that be you or your kids? And your grandkids. Because when we look back, we can see far more than these exiles could ever see. They could look back to Abraham and Sarah. We can look back to the cross. 
We can look upon the rock, the rock that will withstand any storm. And when we look to the cross, we see how God in his infinite power can transform this emblem of suffering and shame into joy and gladness and something we can sing about because of his grace at work in our lives. He can do that. Do you trust him? Look back upon the cross. If God can do that from the cross, if God can save a sinner like you using the cross, what can he not do? What can he not do? Let's trust him. Let's trust him. And let's rejoice in the joy and the gladness. May there be the sound of singing in his Zion today. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to him in prayer now. Father, when we find ourselves in the dark, when we find ourselves battling discouragement and despair, when we find ourselves questioning if if you've forgotten us or forsaken us, Lord, would you lead us to look back? Would you lead us to look back to the rock from which we were cut? Would you lead us to look back to our spiritual heritage, where we come from? Whatever our biological family may have been like, Lord, we can look back upon the spiritual heritage we have through you. And Lord, as we look back, would you remind us of what you can do with a few faithful people, of what you can do with people who trust in your power, who have confidence in you and in you alone, people who trust that you will have the glory Lord, would you build us up in this faith? And we pray especially for the women, for the mothers in our midst. Lord, would you restore to them the joy of your salvation? Would you renew within them a steadfast spirit? Would you remind them of your power? Would you remind them of what you can do through a few faithful people? And Lord, May we all do this so that the next generation would know of your wonders and great deeds. In the meantime, Lord, may we enjoy the sweetness that comes from simply taking you at your word. Even when all the evidence is against us, even when we have to hope against hope, Lord, may we trust. All for your glory and honor, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.